Welcome to this week's episode of our weekly feature from Tea's Life, Borough Backtrack. As always, in association with Teesside's best place for pizza, that's Domino's. Before I introduce this week's guests, who, who does love good pizza? We all love the footy too, of course, and we're grateful to the support of the best place for pizza, Domino's Teesside, for helping bring the two together with the support of Borough Track Backtrack. Now, this week's guests are two former Borough stars, one, um, really both of them from a great era of the borough, the mid 80s. Who can forget that great era? If you lived through it, it was a special time, the mid 80s into the late 80s, two promotions, no less. But it all came from some dark days, and um, I think borough fans right now might be thinking that we might be heading back to one or two of those dark days, but let, let's hope for some improved results in the weeks ahead. My first guest today. I'm delighted to be joined by a true Borough legend. He played left-back, right-back, centre-back during two playing spells with the Borough. And he was also a part of the club's coaching team under Gareth Southgate. And as I recall, um, Colin, I think he even played in goal on one special occasion. A big welcome to you, Colin Cooper. There is not one position I didn't play. I played every position on the pitch. Every position? Every position. Wow. I don't remember you playing centre-forward. I don't think Bernie yeah, Slim would have been. Yeah, well, I played centre-forward in my testimonial game against Kievo for two minutes. So there you go. That was the last one. <laughs> yeah, that's why I've forgotten it. That's why I've forgotten it. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, joining Coops is one of his former Borough teammates in that very special era of the mid to late 80s. He astonishingly played more than 250 Borough games despite being forced into retirement due to a knee injury at the age of just 24 a midfield legend who now lives in the US. So this week, you're speaking to us from a little closer to home, Gary Hamilton, from Scotland, from Bonnie, Scotland. Thanks for joining hey. us, Hammy. No problem, Dave. Thanks very much for the invite. Hey, Coops, how are you doing? Good, mate. Good. And, and Hammy, you're visiting uh, relatives back in Scotland this week? Yeah, actually, we're home for about six or seven weeks, just getting some right. stuff sorted out and then heading back. We had to do the two weeks quarantine, so make sure you get that in there. I don't want any of the government people after me. Um, I did do my two weeks and then we're heading back, I think, the first week of August. So, always good to come home. We're very fortunate we come home quite a bit. So, we have a place in Fife and I'm just in Glasgow right now through seeing my father. So, it's all good. It's good to hear you calling it home as well still. And what, 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 is, what is home back in the US then? Whereabouts is that? Yeah, funny enough, a little place called McAllen, Texas, founded by a Scotsman. I didn't go there for them reasons. I mean, it just actually fell on my kind of lap. Um, if you're a whiskey drinker as well, McAllen whiskey, really strange. Um, and um, we're on the border of Mexico. I mean, Monterey is actually only two hours drive away from us. It's easier for me to go to Monterey than it is San Antonio, Houston or Austin or Dallas. It's easier to go south, but don't often go south. I mean, over the last few years, they've had their own troubles with um, different things going on. So, but uh, yeah, we love it. Um, people think it's marvellous because it's always 100 degrees heat, but mm, me being the white pale Scotsman, no, it's not that great. I mean, not if you have to live in it, so, but we love it. Te Texas. You're on the border of Mexico, there's no huge walls appearing yet then, I take it? Well, there's a fence, there's a, and I mean, they're not about, about building a wall, I don't know why, because there's a fence there that nobody can get over, so, and I mean, I mean, and that fence has been there for the last decade, but uh, that's the politic thing, and I hope we don't get into the discussion of politics in this conversation. Not because, today. <laughs> nah, good, because uh, I've got too much to say on that, and I never get involved in politics. So, Colin looks relieved too that he's thinking, no, don't go politics. No. <laughs> um, instead, we're going to talk football, we're going to talk Borough specifically, and um, I'm going to take both of you back, because um, now, I think I'm right in saying that um, Colin... Certain Willie Madron gave you your debut for the Borough. Um, how many you go back a little bit further then? Because am I right in saying that um, Malcolm Allison gave you um, yeah. your big chance when you were yeah. when you were seventeen? Um, I mean, I mean, I think fans are always interested to hear um, how you found different managers and you know what what were they like. So like, how many you worked under you worked under Big, uh, big Mal and then Willie Madron came in. Um, I, I, I'm get, did, did, would you, you'd have probably been in uh, Bobby Murdoch's youth team as well, were you? As, um, it was, I Bobby, know it was I, so, so first, well thought. Yeah, I first came down under Bobby, and that was really one of the reasons I moved to Middlesbrough because I'm a big Celtic fan, and Bobby means a legend at Celtic, and 
And I didn't have a say in any of the decisions of where I was going. I mean, my mother had that decision. As long as it was outside Glasgow, we didn't. She didn't care. I was just never going to be able to stay at home. Um, so, and Middlesbrough came in last. I came down for a day's tryout or something like that. And as soon as my mother had seen who was the manager at that time as well, just because of Bobby, I think there was a bit of an influence, of, like influx of like Scottish guys in the team as well. Um, none of them were any good, to be honest. But um, then they just. I mean, the Medhurst Hotel, I think, was the biggest selling point for my mum. The Medhurst Hotel was like a, a big thing in Lintop Road, a big big house that had 19 rooms. And if you were from out of town, you stayed there. So my mother loved that. I ended up signing for Middlesbrough and really never looked back. I, I think it's probably the best move I did make because I was really supposed to go to West Brom or Everton. And um, so, I mean, it just the Northies was much closer to Glasgow. But yeah, so I started under Bobby. I actually, uh, and then Malcolm, but I actually had the pleasure of Jack Charlton as well. Because Jack, like, canned one of his fishing trips and came back to coaches for about a month. And that was uh, experience in itself. So it was. Uh, tell us, tell us more, what, you, what do you remember about Big Jack? Uh, he should have stuck with his fishing hat on his head and his rod in the water. Because, my God, I really, to this day, I don't know how it's the first time I've ever heard that the only one two you play in this field is with Godson and that baffled me as a sixteen year old. I didn't even know what he meant until one of the pros showed me flick it up and just boot it down the field and that kind of stuff. But I think Big Jack, they bless him that he just he got brought in to try and steady the ship like it's happened a few times over the last few years as well. And then then, then they brought Malcolm in. And then Malcolm Allison at, at Cups were you there with Malcolm? I, I yeah. don't know if people remember Malcolm like I remember him. Um, fortunately for me, he loved me for some reason. He really, really liked me um, as a player. And I thought Malcolm was a way beyond his time as a coach. I mean, he was doing things that we... we I, I mean, I just thought he was like drunk on champagne and stuff like that when he was asking us to dance and he would get the dance instructor in. And then we actually, I think, were one of the first clubs to have their own fitness actual trainer. Was it Roger Spryker? Right? Oh, yeah. yeah. And he was, and then I remember one preseason, we went to preseason, and we did not do the normal run up like Eston Hills with somebody on your back and stuff like that. We actually, Malcolm went straight into playing like 3v3s and 4v4s, and we were all like, oh, he's lost the plot. And then, um, but he wasn't in that. We started that season, I'll never forget it. I think we went seven on the balance, but then the, the nice cold winter came in. And the big thick pitches of like three foot of crap and mud, and I think we just barely escaped relegation that year. Mm. So we did, but Malcolm was fantastic I, as a coach. I mean, a, a coach on the field with players. I had said without a doubt, Malcolm was the best coach I've ever played under. It's just a shame that I think he was mm. a way beyond his time then that people thought he was strange. Malcolm was probably doing things back in '84 that yeah. they're probably doing today. And the club was skint, of course. That doesn't help. <laughs> Um, Colin, what do you remember, Big Mal? You'd have only been a young lad coming through the, the youth ranks, yeah? No, so my, my first summer on leaving school, um, Malcolm had just come in. Um, and I remember vividly exactly what Hammy's just said. We did lots and lots of technical drills. And we did them on the pitch a lot of the times. We did a, we did a thing because uh, my first year was half full-time apprentices and half, um, it was the first year of the old YTS scheme. So I think, I don't know whether it was one of the, one of the local, you know, BBC or Time T's did a thing. <clears throat> and I remember Malcolm taking us for a training session on the pitch. And it's exactly what Hammy described. It was all technical, all about the ball, possessions, uh, directional, multi-directional. And it was, yeah, it was. And then he did, he did a lot of technical work. We had Danny Bagarin with him or Danny came in and, and, and did a lot of technical work as in passing and different techniques of passing. So, yeah, I agree with Hammy. Probably... Wrong place at the wrong time for a guy who, who, who actually, you know, when he, was, when he was at Man City, was revered as someone that was working way beyond his years. And, and as I say, probably, unfortunately for, 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 for the club, maybe, like you say, no money. Um, it was probably a last chance saloon for somebody like Big Mal. But I have to agree with Hammy that the, the, the actual technical practices that we did were, were drills that people will still do today. Back I still in remember uh, talking to Willie Madron about, because Willie uh, was brought back by Big Mal initially. And um, I remember, Will, I think Willie might have even been the physio for a little while. And um, 
Willie said he was in the dressing room one day and he said that was nothing to do with the coaching, but he says, and it was a bit of like early psycho sports psychology. And he started, he started saying that how um, he got everybody around in the group in the dressing room and they all had to, they all had to chant, we're going to win, we're going to win, we're going to win. And I says, well, what happened? He says, we lost. <laughs> he says, it didn't work. And he says, we gave up on that one the next week. So, mm. But the early psychology in it, and it's not the first time we've heard that Big Mal was ahead of yeah. his time. And of course, then that man that came in, I've just mentioned, Willie Madron was the new manager. And again, um, you know, I mean, obviously, God rest his soul, a great, a great man. Um, we lost well before his time. Um, but what was what was Willie like as a, a, a manager, Hammy? How, how did you find him? Obviously, very different from from Big Mal, who's the the larger than larger than life character. Yeah, I mean, Willie being a Willie being a local lad as well, he had that pride within him that he really <coughs> everybody to do well. Plus, his his hands were very tight. I mean, um, that's when Coops and Parky and all them started make appearances and Pally and all that stuff because we didn't have any money. I mean, I played in them 83, 84 days. They were very dark. And um, I'm hoping and praying that we don't go back to them in this current state. Everybody thinks we're going to drop down a division and go and smash it, really. Is that what people think? Um, it's not 1986. I mean, it's really not. But anyway, Willie was Willie was brilliant. And Willie had to entrust a lot of the local lads. He really did because that's all he had. He had no money at all. So he basically went to the, the youth team and brought in the likes of, uh, like Coops was already kind of there, but Parky and stuff like that. And he was a player's kind of manager. You know? I mean, Willie was, he, he wanted you to do well. He was not a shouter or screamer or anything like that. He, he just, he, he was really too nice, to be honest, as well. I mean, I really, I had all the love in the world for Willie. I, I thought the guy was, obviously, he's a club legend and all that stuff. And obviously, with the history of Middlesbrough now, you don't want to be a legend and take over the team because you're getting fired within... Pretty soon, <laughs> the um, he, he was he was a, he was a lovely man. Collins, uh, Collins, immediately thinking of people like Gareth Southgate and Jonathan Woodgate as well. Yes, but yeah, it does, never seems to, to go well. It's possibly uh, not a great marriage. Thing, yeah, the one thing I will say about Willie is, um, is that Bruce got all the credit. I mean, and and I think obviously Bruce deserves whatever Bruce credit gets. But you've got to remember that was actually Willie's team. Yeah. I mean, Willie, Willie went and got Percy and stuff like that. I mean, that was all about, well, actually, I think it was Malcolm at first. Yeah. Of it, mm -hmm. And then, um, so really, Bruce inherited <clears throat> in a bad time, and a dark time, but he inherited a bunch of lads who were fortunate enough that stayed. And then Bruce just took, just carried the kind of flag from there. But, but that was really Willie's group of kids, and he never got really the chance to kind of work with them. I don't know if it would have worked the same as it did with Bruce either with Willie. I'm not I'm not being detrimental to anybody. I'm just being honest and um I mean Bruce came in and it was just a different kind of atmosphere altogether. But as for Willie, he was great. It's a shame I didn't get to spend a longer time with him as a player and a coach kind of partnership. It's it's it Colin, you must have seen it as a I'm guessing that you really looked up to, you know, Willie Madron, the guy that gives you your, your debut in the first team. Um what what's your memories of him? Well, a bit of both, really, because um, the actual honest bit for, for me and Willie is exactly, again, what Hammy describes. Willie came in. So I got into the first team squad under Malcolm um, as a 17-stroke 18-year-old, uh, but playing as a right-sided midfield player. I was a central midfield player as a kid, like Hammy. Um, and then what happened after Malcolm left, Willie was actually, as Hammy said, he was, he was, he was one of these guys who was who was doing loads of jobs. So he was doing a bit of physio. He was my youth team coach. Um, so the, the, the plus for me was Willie saw something in me that he saw himself as a kid. Um, again, I was a central midfield player. Um, I was short when I got into the club, grew a little bit. So I was tall and skinny. Um, didn't look like, didn't look like a, an elegant central midfield player and certainly didn't look like a centre-back. But Willie... Willie kind of blended me in the youth team as a centre back come sweeper, which is what he played. You know, he was he was always the the one who could handle the ball. He wasn't the rough, tough one, but he could handle himself physically. And he would be the one that would kind of sweep behind the real centre half, if you like. Um, and so I adopted that role in the youth team. Um, and as I say, so the, the lucky thing for me was it steps through your career. You've got to You've got to get lucky with certain people. And with me, Willie was the first one that really took me under my wing. I, 
I was really grateful for, for Malcolm for the um, for the initiation, getting into the club, and you know signing um, signing the contract and getting her in around the first team. But yeah, Willie was the one that that spiraled me into the into the first team squad. He gave me my first professional contract, gave me my uh, my league debut, um, and like Hammy says, that that season, unfortunately, which led to us being relegated post liquidation. Um, you know, I'd played um, my first. 10, 11 games in the first team under Willie. Um, and unfortunately, you know, the team wasn't good enough to stay in the division. But yeah, so for me, it was, it was meeting somebody who, who had belief or faith in the ability that I had, because I certainly didn't have any physical capabilities at that point. Um, I could run, I could jump, but I was, I was as skinny as a rake. So, so I have to, and I've said it many, many times, I have to thank Willie from from the bottom of my heart, because he saw something in me that, that allowed me to, 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 to have a football career. Um, yeah. So, what did, he, what did, he, did he get you on the weights then, or tell you to do weights or anything like that? Or? Well, as, as, as Hammy said, you know, the, the thing that happened with, with Malcolm and, and people like Roger Spry, which was, which was mind blowing. But in theory, when Malcolm left, we, we didn't, we didn't, we had nothing. We had nothing. So we had the little gym at the back of the sports hall, uh, upstairs, um, linked into Ayrson Park which had some equipment in, so players would have um, a thing. But I, unfortunately, you know, I, even, even, even now in my 50s, I, I could go to the gym five times a week and I ain't going to be a big bloke. So it's both lucky in the fact that I ain't going to be a big bloke, but it's also the fact that I had to, I had to adopt in order to survive. Um, because, you know, Hammy was, Hammy was tough, Hammy was solid, um, and he could play football as well. I was as skinny as a rake. Anyone could dominate me physically, so I had to find a way. And Willie was the first person to help me find a way to try and find other ways to dominate. About how you nip in front of defend, uh, how you nip in front of attackers instead of trying to physically outbattle them. How you would jump later than they did to maximise the height that you had. How you would drop off when you knew they weren't going to be able to control it, so they would just flick it on. So the the actual intelligence, um, Willie turned me. And again, I, you know, because I'd played. As you said, I played every position. So, so basically, Willie transformed me into a into a. Um, when I was a kid, I was a goal scorer midfield player. I would bomb forward and score loads of goals from midfield. My dad always said because because of the way I played as a centre midfield player, I would end up playing the back, and he was right. And and Willie saw that. Willie saw that. And again, you talk about people thinking outside the box, and I was lucky that Willie saw something in me that allowed me to. But in saying that. When I when I made my debut in the first team, I played my debut as left side centre centre midfield um, against Hull City at Ayrson Park. So, um, but yeah, I was lucky. I was lucky. Willie was a great man and 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 had a massive impact on on my uh, you know people who have impact on your life. But Willie was the first person to have a real impact on me in, um, at the football club. And then of course in came eventually the, the decision was made. Willie was moved out and they brought in Bruce Rayock. And of course, talking about people who've changed your life, I mean, Bruce Riott had a major impact on uh, your own lives and careers because he, he brought success to back-to-back -back promotions. Turned sour in the end, didn't it? But I mean, look, what do you remember about that, that team and the, the camaraderie that came out of the liquidation of 1986 when you probably wondered what, what, what on earth was going to come next to then... Somehow we end up with a, this amazing winning team. How many well, yeah. you remember memory there? First, first thing that we have to remember is that Willie brought Bruce in. Yep. Yes. Of yes. Yeah. Yes. Of course. Yeah. The end of the end of the end of that period of time, um, and it was only the fact that when we got relegated, and obviously the 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 uh, you know the the nastiness hit the fans, so to speak, that that you know Willie couldn't continue. So so you know again we have to recognise that Willie saw something in Bruce. To bring him in, because what Bruce's reputation was as a player, no one, no one would have known at that point that he actually was a really, was a good coach and a, and, a, and a very good footballer himself. But again, because of the reputation he had as a player, has been like a, a silent assassin, if you like. Um, he, he he didn't get the credit for being for being a good coach. But but Willie brought him in at the end of that season in '85. What was he like then, Bruce? Army. 
Uh, firstly, let me go back to tell you how skinny Coops really was. Um, he used to really, really piss me off. He was the only person that would get weighed with his bag on, over his back. No, over him. He had his green, I remember it was a green McEwen's Lager bag that we had sponsored bags or something like that. And Coops used to have his bag full coming in from trim dinner or whatever on a Monday morning and he would stand there with the bag on him. Getting weighed nice to go, come on, son, give that up. I mean, get the bag off for Christ's sake. Let's see what you really weigh. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, um, and look what he turned into. Incredible. So, yeah, Bruce, I, I think I've got uh, uh, more kind of memories with Bruce because we actually lived together, which was really, really odd. I mean, we were really the odd couple. And, um, and I will say because of the dark days and, and you've got to remember, I was relatively young myself, but I was young, but also one of the more experienced players that was left. And um, I didn't know where it was going to go. I was actually just thinking about heading back to Scotland to play, to be honest. I went down to Charlton and, funny enough, spoke to <coughs> Lenny Lawrence and stuff like that. But London was never, ever going to be for me. I mean, my one of my favourite things was playing against teams from London because I could stand them. So why the hell was I going to move down there? Um, so... Bruce, when he came in, like we said earlier, um, I mean, he inherited the whole thing. I mean, I don't think Bruce added the single player until Lawsy, I think, maybe have been one of the first ones in. And um, just a different mindset. I mean, everybody talks about the camaraderie and stuff like that. I, I think the lads were together because one had to be together. We weren't going to be together. We were kidding ourselves because we had nothing. Um, I honestly truly believe that every player could have left Middlesbrough Football Club at that time and gone on and probably had a, a, a decent career. Would some of them have been as successful as they've been? Maybe not, but I think everybody had potential still to play professionally. So I, I don't know what kept us there. Um, I know I ate with Bruce every single night and his belief of the club surviving was truly, truly amazing. I mean, that guy was going in his own pocket. He was paying for Joe the kit man and all that kind of stuff. I, the stuff I got to know personally, and yeah, that's the reason, one of the reasons that I became so adamant that I was staying because I've seen here's the manager who he's not even from the area, um, captain of Scotland and all that stuff. He didn't have to, in the World Cups, he didn't have to be doing this, but he truly, he truly loved the town and, um, and, and he wanted to make something of it. And, and you know, I he had my full back, and that was the only reason. I don't know if he would have had my full back if I didn't live in Digram, um, because I thought he was a bit of a psycho. But the um, and, and he and he wasn't really a psycho. It's just it's just how you, he just didn't like average, and his average was if you were average, even in just not trying. I don't mean average as just being an average player. I'm on about if you came with an just a below par attitude or anything like that, you were going to get it. And, and I think that's what picked us all up. I mean, and plus we were all young. I mean, we were young. We were scared of them. We were frightened of them. I think we were all just getting into having just girlfriends at the time. I think there was only Archie and Lawsy maybe that were married um, and that kind of stuff. But uh, Bruce, I don't think anybody will ever, ever say anything bad about Bruce because we don't have anything to say bad about Bruce. The only thing I can say that I've told him to his face is thank you because I think he's made me the man I am today. Um, and I'll never change that uh, opinion of Bruce Rio because he really did. And if you if you look overall in that squad, and it's his favorite favorite thing to say is he's proud of each and every one of us because we've never really got into any serious trouble. You've not really seen anybody hit headlines and papers and that kind of stuff because he instilled in us being decent human beings, I think. And let me take the football aside, and um, and then he just had this willingness to win. His willingness to win was phenomenal. I, I just thought he had these little breaks where Coops will vouch for it. He would say, okay, we're going to go like seven on a bounce without getting beaten. I used to look at him and go, does he know the history here? Is he crazy? And um, it would happen though. They just And then I suppose when that happens, Dave, you just get a self-belief. And once you do that, I think we went 13 games once and it was like the joy of going 13 games, not getting beat. Oh, and plus, hang on, winning a win bonus. That was always a nice thing because I didn't get many of them. That's for sure. And we played we played because we needed that win bonus. Mm -hmm. Not like the boys today. I mean, certain different positions in the league got you a little bit more money. And I think they should bring appearance money back. I know it's never going to happen, Coops, but they should, they should bring appearance money back because nobody was taking my place. I'd have killed you in training just because I needed to be on that first 11 because... I needed that money. 
and um, it was very, very important. But Bruce instilled that. He was fortunate, I think, <coughs> because fixing the rules and the regulations back then. Um, obviously, like you said earlier, it turned a little bit sour and stuff. But I think that period of 86 and Bruce and that squad, or I don't think anybody can take it away, uh, what happened and what was achieved and stuff like that. And, uh, and I think uh, every time I go home, I mean, and I class middles, but it's home, that it's truly amazing that the people from that era and the fans from that area, era, that they're just so appreciative of what, what was happened and what was achieved. And, and, and I'm just happy and proud to be part of that history because it's always going to be there. That's going to be history of Middlesbrough Football Club. Definitely a key part. Uh, Colin, I mean, Bruce Rayock obviously loved you because he signed you again, didn't he, uh, Millwall? So the, uh, um, got, what, what you, what's your memory? I mean, Bernie Slavens always talked, described him as a sergeant major. But Bernie, of course, was a different type of character. But even though he appreciated him, he, Bernie probably, um, he says, he, he always says, well, Tony, Mo Tony Mowbray was Bruce's type of character. And he says, and I, and he, I found him, he found me difficult and I found him difficult. But what, what about yourself? Bernie, we all found Bernie difficult. What are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> no, again, I was, um, yeah, where, as a, Again, my, my career was on was on was on a knife edge. It's as simple as that. You know, Hammy, Hammy's right. You don't you don't know what would have happened had that actually not happened. If you if you understand what I'm saying, um, my career was on a knife edge, and so we had two options. We, we 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 you either you either get out and and try and go on trial somewhere, or you get on with it. Um, I looked at it logically, and I I didn't think I had another option. Um, Chief scout at the time, Barry Geldart, who was Barry used to say, well, listen, I can get you a trial here, I can get you a trial there. And, I'm, and I, you know, I haven't just broken into the first team, you're thinking my career could be, and I've said it many times, my career could be over before it's even really begun. Um, but also, I think Hammy's right. I think what the one thing that Middles was always done is, in my opinion, like I, 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 do, I, I wasn't, I was young, too young to work with Big Jack, but the coaches I always worked with at the club always insisted that we try and play decent football. Or we tried to get the ball down and when we had Hutton Road as a training ground, that was obviously the, um, it used to, you know, in the summer it was bumpy road, in the winter it was bumpy road, but you used to hone your technique because you used to have to concentrate on being able to control and pass. Um, so I always look at the coaches that I worked with and Bruce, and Bruce came in with Willie, I think probably for that reason, because Willie saw something that Bruce was, Bruce was a fantastic footballer. We all have to remember that he was a fantastically technically gifted footballer, as well as being hard as nails. Um, and the things, the things that Hammy spoke about are the things that Bruce instilled in us all. A, we want to try and play some good football when we can. Um, we want to look after ourselves and each other when we can. If there's a mall, we, we were all expected to be in it together, um, you know, looking after our mate. And, and yeah, and, and basically it was, it was a case of, I think Hammy's right in the fact that both, I think because of the background of the football club, A, giving young players a chance, which... There was no other option but to give young players a chance in, in the football club was one of the reasons I signed as a 13-year-old. Um, and the other thing was that we knew on the pitch, Ayrson Park was always obviously a, it was a fantastic football pitch. Yes, it did get claggy and wet, and, but you know they used to look after it and it, it always had a fantastic surface. So we, it, was, it was right to try and play good football at, um, and especially on them evenings where there was a bit, it was a bit dewy and you could zip it about. And Bruce loved <clears throat> loved us playing fast attacking football. Um, but we also got lucky in the fact, like Hammy said, the group of players that came in, like my era, the, the likes of Ripper and Parky behind me, the year behind me, um, and the lads that were already there. You know, the, the likes of Mogger and obviously Pally came in and Pearsy. They're all they're all really good people. And Bruce instilled in us. Um, and I know Tony's mentioned it and Hammy's just mentioned it. Bruce instilled in us that first and foremost, we were, we, we were, we were going to be, um, we were going to look like a team as often as we possibly could, despite not having any money. We were going to act like a team and we were going to, we were going to try and play like a team. Um, and that with the little bits of discipline, you know, being on time, clean shaving, which is obviously the big thing for Slav, being smartly dressed. You know, yeah, he was a sergeant major because his father was a sergeant major. So what he instilled in us was, was um, a pride in the way we looked, a pride in the way we played, and a pride in each other. And I think, um, and Hammy's, Hammy's dead right. I mean, you know, I spent a lot of time with Hammy when I, when I was living in the Medhurst and 
And then Hammy moved out with Bruce to Mrs. Crombie's on Ackham Road. And I spent a lot of time with Hammy when I was, you know, when I was in my um, late teens. Um, and we, we became really close friends. And, and he's, he's right in what he said. You know, Bruce, Bruce was a thinker. So Malcolm had ideas that were, were years in advance. Willie had a real feeling for, for, for young players and, and, for, and for the town, obviously. Bruce, Bruce had the extra bit, and he just um, and he eked every bit out of us that he possibly could. And I don't think um, just following up on that because I don't think Bruce was frightened either in that time to experiment. I mean, he 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 had the total belief of if you were good, he made you feel that way. The one big thing about Bruce that the camaraderie was built was he's the only manager to this day I still hear he is say. I'm not an idiot. I don't expect these to be the best of friends because I'm lying to myself. He says, you're just going to respect each other every time you're around me, the stadium and training. Because we all had to be, we were different characters completely. Once we went out that stadium or once we left the training grounds, we, a lot of us went in our own little ways. And he was as cute and smart enough to think right there and then, I don't expect you to hang around together. I mean, I do not expect that whatsoever. And I think he gave us the freedom outside the club to be with our own people. But when we were together, I remember going to America. I thought I was going on a holiday and all the hell it wasn't a holiday. I was like, come on, Bruce, it's got to be a bit of a vacation. He's like, no, we act, we travel, we act, we do everything as a team. And certain individuals had a bit of a tough time with that at first. Um, I mean, I know we don't have to name them. And by the way, I was one of the ones that was up on the big fine list as well. I got fined every week. So I think I just get fined just for being Gary Hamilton or something like that. I mean, so, but that was him just showing you, that was sometimes him just reeling you in, just to say, okay, you're, you're getting a little bit out of control here. I'll just reel you in a little bit. And um, he was a master at that. And his psychology sometimes was just, his psychology after the Leicester game still blows me away to this day how much that man hated gambling because I heard it every day. Why do I gamble? Why do I gamble on the bus? You should stop this. It's not going to be any good. But I'd still play cards on the back of the bus. And then um, that Monday Coops when Leicester beat us and we went in and then he comes out with like, okay, the club's going to put this much money behind you. And by the way, I'd lost complete interest. Um, I have no things to tell anybody. I think I was still drunk from the weekend anyway. I didn't want to be there. I didn't even want to be at training because mm. Chelsea... I just, I just had the thought of Chelsea were they were a powerful team at the time. I mean, just to stop you there for anybody who doesn't who doesn't know, or maybe it's forgotten. Of course, we got the last game of the season. Um, if we'd have beaten Leicester on the last day of the game of the season, we'd have been promoted. Didn't go quite as to plan. I think a certain Gary McAllister got one of the goals for Leicester that day. You got a cracker. A couple of long range belters yeah. that they scored. Um, I thought Jesse should have saved it. To be honest. We lost the game, we didn't go up and we were into the playoffs and suddenly we were, and back then, the weird thing was we were playing not another team that was it's trying a, to win promotion. It's the first time I've ever we seen We were trying it. to avoid relegation. Yeah. It's the first time I've ever seen a club like get over the side as well during that whole period, build up to that. I don't know if Coops are even upstairs, but if you remember, I used to go upstairs to the gym and warm right. up with, uh, with Morgan uh, before we'd go out. And it was like a party atmosphere. There was like trophies around the place and stuff. And I'm like, what the hell? Because I'd never seen that before. And that wasn't like us. And obviously, Bruce had nothing to do with that. And I think just the mindset. And I think we'd already thought, we, we, we've already worked that hard. Anyway, long story short was, the Leicester, I mean, had a very, very good team. Um, they actually, uh, I thought, like totally outplayed us that day. Um, and then on the Monday morning, Bruce came in and said, the club, the board of directors were going to put this much money in. We just had to, double it up and, and uh, I think we were something like five to one to win the playoffs and my god what a way to grab some people's attention because we were down and out I tell you we were down and out and I was like well wow if he believes we can win this and Chelsea's in the group then he's got my attention again and there you go we all forgot about the money actually until after the Chelsea game until he threw it on the tables and everybody ran away with all the money <laughs> but the um, just just simple little things like that. That the guy hated gambling. I mean, couldn't stand it. And he was, how do I get the attention of these players quickly? Because them games came quick and fast. And truly amazing. He, he done some things that to me, again, maybe a little bit beyond his time as well. But it wasn't anything by fear. It was basically by kidology and stuff like that. He was a, he was a very smart man. Very smart. He had some great stories as well. Mm. So he did.